myself, Nina, and Rebecca, we're, uh, we're facilitating today. Um, so just to start off with, uh, we have a Jamboard. And if you don't see the link in the chat, I'm just going to reshare it in there. Um, copy link. So yeah, go ahead and on that Jamboard, um, just you can create a sticky note on there and just share some thoughts about what makes you nervous about teaching financial literacy. And I'll paste that right now. Okay. And oh yeah, um, also for the Jamboard, I was thinking we can make it kind of like a concept map. So after you put your um, sticky note, you can like use the pen and you can like draw lines um, between whichever sticky notes you see connections between. Um, and also you can just draw a line like between your own sticky note and the question. Just a different kind of visual way to represent it. Nina, there are amazing comments on the Jamboard. Like some really, really, really good questions. Um, would y'all like me to screen share the Jamboard or is everyone okay just looking at it in like a different tab on their computers? I think you should screen share it just for a moment so we can kind of get a sense of what everybody has there. Okay. I appreciate people's honesty. <laughs> I can definitely relate to some of it <laughs> or a lot of it. Um, should we do like one more minute working on the Jamboard and then we'll discuss? Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for sharing all these awesome, yeah, thoughts and personal experiences and things that make you nervous about teaching financial literacy. It seems like um, if you didn't know already, uh, now you know that you're not the only one <laughs> who has some trepidation about it. Um, yeah. So um, let's see. Does anybody want to share more about what they wrote, like elaborate on it? Well, I'll jump in. Um, I know financial literacy isn't really one of the four topics for the HSE program. I mean, basically math, science, language arts, and uh civics but you can tie it into civics and math very easily so there may be some trepidation about that i would um disagree because financially it is tightly related to math so uh, I, there's a lot of ways in which you can create that uh those topics harmony but uh, I think there's one posted that says that they're not great about that themselves. And I think that's something that we, we cannot teach something that, uh, or we shouldn't be teaching something that can misguide our students. So if, if you, if you don't want to, if you want to teach something, you need to be good at it yourself. So start with little things and, and then you can teach it because now you know the outcomes and the struggles and the, even if it's as simple as save three hundred dollars for an emergency fund right um, <clears throat> go for it go through that step yourself and then you can relate to what you're going to be teaching your students because it's really it, this is pretty sensitive topic we cannot just be playing around with it Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, I saw there's um, a sticky note on the Jamboard here uh, kind of talking about that. Um, sometimes finances are strongly linked to sensitive personal issues. So that's one part of it. Um, 
Yeah, and I think we will talk a little bit about that too. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. And that is like for fun. If you want to teach history and go for it, that's fine. Go do it, right? But financial theory is is a different monster. So um, you, you don't want to be misguiding people or or sharing information or having them sharing information that uh, might create some uh, turmoil in their family dynamic or anything like that. So th this is something that I think we need to be cautious about it. And I think, um, but at the same time that we can learn with students, um, and, and it comes down to the materials that you have, you know, really utilizing good, solid materials and information so that you're not sharing the wrong thing, but you can still teach it and learn with your students. Um, Bill, do you want to add anything before I hand it over to you and go to the next slide? No, I just, it surprises me that it's so controversial. You know, I didn't, I really didn't expect this. It's, that's interesting. Yeah, you can go to the next slide if you want, Nina. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the Jamboard and go back to our presentation. So, financial literacy basically has three main components. And, you know, after listening to this jam board, which was really eye opening, at least to me, I would actually change the center circle um, instead of the three facets of financial literacy change it to the three facets of financial capability because that's what we're really trying to teach our students um, that they need to be financially capable to actually be a productive um, you know um, citizen in this in this life they can't be uh, tied down by you know, always going to a payday loan type thing or a title loan or not being able to, um, you know, whether a, a shock, financial shock in their day-to-day um, -day lives. Um, so we're teaching a, basically, a, a, I think, a broader, maybe a 10,000-foot view of financial capability instead of really getting right down to the nitty-gritty of maybe their personal situation. Um, knowledge and that financial capability is really information that they gained uh, through experience and they do have some prior knowledge on that or through education which is going to be our part of the program here. Uh, skill is basically the ability to do something you know well. Can they create a, a good budget? Do they know where their finances are being uh, spent at which category and finally confidence is the i guess the state of being certain of you know what they're doing is actually you know true it's going to work out um, uh, i have to relate to one project i did with my class while i taught in deming and it was tied into math pretty easy is uh, the speed limit on I-10 is 65 miles an hour in Deming, and then you can get up to 75 on the way to Crucis, and then back down to 65 within Crucis. And we're talking about rate of change. We didn't really get into it, but I just said, you know, you're going from 65 to 75, and then from 75 back to 65, do you think the rate of change is going to be the same, greater or lesser on either end? And everyone said it's going to be the same because they were going plus 15 and minus 15, and they found out that it wasn't, and that was an eye-opener for them. So they just need to know those skills. Want to get the next slide, Nina or Rebecca? So why is financial literacy important for our students? Um, 
first of all, they really have to have control over their finances. You know, whether it be day to day, month to month, or even just a year end review. Um, capacity to absorb financial shock. I mean, look at what's happening right now with inflation. Um, it's going to be hard for some people. We had a friend over for lunch the other day from Deming, and he said that the natural gas bill in Deming went up like 300%. Uh, you know, wow. Yeah. And he's looking at cutting back on something just to be able to afford that $400 natural gas bill, which was amazing, something we haven't seen here in Las Cruces. Uh, the ability to meet financial goals. Um, you know, if you don't, have a final destination, as the saying goes, any road's going to get you there. So, you know, you need to have a goal, be it, you know, the savings of $100 uh, a month or every two months and make sure that you're on track for that. And then the freedom to choice. Uh, you want to keep being beholden to, you know, not be able to buy what you need or to go to payday loans or title loans and that type of um area. Let me go to the next slide, please. And we're missing the <laughs> really didn't do it animated, but okay. So how and why do we teach financial literacy? Um why? and this is speaking from the HSE side, um, their daily actions impact your financial uh, circumstances. You know, can they afford, you know, a book or a resource that we might need or a calculator for the class? We give them a lot, but, you know, there's certain items that they may want to purchase. Not everyone receives financial education, either through um, going through um, the early grades in elementary or high school up to the point where they might have, you know, stopped learning, or is their family financially literate where they actually told them what they need to do? Uh, students or learners as consumers face complex financial um, de decisions every day, you know, be it buying a car or as mundane as maybe buying a spring pump. You know, can they you know, make the best decision. And financial stress obviously affects their health and work performance. I mean, if they're stressing out on where the next dollar is coming from to put food on the table, uh, they're going to end up being, you know, with the health condition. And they're going to be thinking about it all during the work day or the student or the school day. So they're not going to really focus on what's being presented to them. How do I do it in an HSE class? Uh, there's a wealth of technology available. Um, and technology is not the end all and be all. It's just an aid. Um, if they don't know what numbers to put into a formula to calculate something like just, you know, debits and credits or rate of change, having a calculator is not going to help them at all. They'll just get to the wrong answer a lot quicker. But they do have those tools available. I mean, there's a calculator for um, in, in every smartphone that I'm aware of. Um, flyers from the local newspaper, great way to uh, put that as a background for your lesson and find out, you know, uh, unit pricing. Four sleeves of Coke for $12, what's one cost? You know, you can tie that into ratios and proportions very easily. The flyer that I have illustrated there, you can, can't really see it, but you can buy two for a certain price, and then the third and fourth one up become more. So you could actually talk, well, how much is it going to be if I buy two items, or three, or four? Um, creating a budget. It's a great way to sit there and talk about percentages, how much money is going toward your food category, your transportation category. You can also introduce it into um, Excel if you want and start talking about spreadsheets and all the formulas that go with that. 
So there's a myriad of ways of bringing it in uh, to your class. Any questions on that before we turn it over to Rebecca? Are there any HSE teachers here, by the way? Oops. I work with HSE teachers. Um, Pardon? I said I work with HSE teachers and students, not the, the teacher and coordinator. Um, so I was wondering, uh, when you're talking about computer, like what's available, do you do you use, I think you said you use like an ad as a basis maybe for a lesson. Um, are there other materials, like have you tried the teaching skills that matter, lesson plans, or are there other materials online? Because there's so much that you've used in life. Uh, the ad brings into, you know, sort of like the contextual part of it. Um, and you get them talking. What really works good is to put them into breakout rooms and then have a discussion and let let them sort of teach each other and found that to be most effective. Um, I don't really care for the technology too much as far as one-on-one -on -one laptops because then they're still isolated, Gary. And more of the learning takes place when they are you know, talking amongst themselves. Class discussions are the best for me, I found. I don't yeah. know if that answers your question or not. But. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Yep, thank you. Rebecca, you want to take over? I will, I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So first, Carrie, um, I want to uh, let you know about a resource that um, I have not used as much in my classroom but that I have some experience with what I was like analyzing resources and that's the um, GFC learn site. I'm going to put it in chat for you and they have a section on money management in there. Um, the one thing I will tell you is that if you're working with a lot of literacy level students, some of the materials on there may be a little high, but um, they're kind of more at the HSC level, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen a lot of materials like that. Right, right. And hello, Suad. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining us. So, Hi, how are um, you? I'm just late because I just finished my class right away. <laughs> I completely understand. Completely understand. Okay. So just, just to recap a little bit, our topic for this, this um, webinar is the financial literacy section of TSTM. That's one of our five topic areas that we have with lesson plans. And I'm going to talk about some things from an ESL teacher point of view for you. Um, and one of the things I want to kind of let you know about is that when this topic came up amongst the larger, our national training, th some of the very same things that you all identified in the Jamboard about your concerns or nervousness about teaching this concept were also identified by instructors in our training. And I personally, have shared those those feelings as well <laughs> and still do i'm not going to say it's like you know oh here's your magic this is over it right um but uh, what i do want to say about that is that instead of spending a lot of time on the on my how and why what i think i is more helpful to share with you is this set of best practices because that's another thing that tstm researched was they looked at best practices for teaching each of these topic areas and this topic area is identified as something that can make all of our students, both HSE and ESL, you know, more successful, more comfortable in their life potentially. But there are some things to think about. So these are the best practices that they shared with us, and I wanted to share them with you. And the first one is to ask your learners what they want to learn about regarding financial literacy. Um, I think this is especially true in ESL because we have a little bit more open curriculum. We're not preparing specifically for a test, but you are all amazing and creative teachers. And so I'm pretty sure that even if your students in HSE bring you a topic, you can think about how to link that back to the HSE, you know, um, exams. Because there are like, you know, Raul, you pointed out with math, for example, there are a lot of linkages with math. The second thing that they recommended was using accessible materials. And um, 
you can just, you know, give me a thumbs up here if you've ever not understood a credit card um, fine print or uh, <laughs> because I will say that I have had that experience or you went to go sign a rental contract or uh, a home purchasing contract and you sign approximately 35 documents and you have no idea what you've just signed, right? And this is true, I think, for a lot of us um, because that's sort of the way the system works. So bringing that into your ESL classroom with your students who are mastering another language and saying, let's talk about, you know, daily versus, you know, monthly compounding interest or something like that. Okay, how many words in there are complicated to your students? Bunches. So um, we love to bring in the real world materials, but sometimes that means we have to think about how to make them more accessible for students. Um, another resource, especially working with ESL, is that a number of particularly credit unions, but some of the for-profit banks as well, have put together financial literacy materials, some of them directed at middle school and high school kids. There are some things you can take from there. Be careful what you take because not everything is appropriate for the situation. Like someone on the Jamboard had mentioned that um, they have 18-year-olds in their classroom or under 18s in their classroom, the same as they have over 18s. So not all the materials that you would get from those institutions might be um, valuable for your students or uh, age appropriate, but some of them are and some of them can be rewritten to make them that way too. I've had real good luck getting stuff from credit unions. The third thing I would say is consider your learner circumstances. And again, this is why I know you're all amazing teachers because when I saw some of the comments in the Jamboard, you are thinking about what are your learner circumstances. If you have um english learners particularly immigrants in your student in your classroom a couple of other things you might want to think about the lesson on how to open a checking account is nowhere near as straightforward if you are an immigrant um, because you're going to have to produce documents that i as a u.s citizen would not have nearly as much difficulty producing at the bank okay so something that's like as straightforward and simple as that everyone should just go out and get a checking account it does not work that way necessarily, all right? Um, you may have some cultural considerations um, about who controls finances in a household. I've interviewed a number of students doing the application with them and say, what's your household income? And they're like, mm, I don't know, which either means they don't want to share it with me, valid, or they genuinely don't know because they are not the person in their household who pays bills. So that's another thing you've got to, you know, keep in mind um, with your learner circumstances. And I think the other thing, too, then is like, what are the economic outlooks? Because this is a challenge that we come into in teaching financial literacy, too. One of the common lessons is let's budget better. And budgeting is a very valuable tool, but if students are living on minimum wage jobs and are not eligible for many social services in this country. Um, there are only so many things that you can actually do with the income of a minimum wage job. It's often not a question of how was your math. It's a question of a minimum wage job does not support a family in the United States. So those are all things really to keep in mind in your considerations to be sensitive in addressing this topic. Um, Raul, I want to, or I don't know if it was you. I'm sorry, I'm pointing you out incorrectly, I think. Um, the, there was a person who pointed out um, that they didn't feel super confident about uh, their own skills in this area of Jamboard. So one of the recommendations and one that I highly recommend is co-teach with guest experts. <laughs> in other words, bring somebody to your class whose job it is to know about debt management <laughs> and things like that, okay? And that takes the burden off of you. You do not have to be the expert area. Um, I've, I've had really good luck in doing this with my students in a, a variety of different things. Home buying. Um, I'm going to talk to you about in, de in detail about one in just a moment. Um, uh, opening bank accounts, uh, credit unions, we've done those as well. So those are places where you can get that information to your students without you having to know it. Uh, in addition to that, they recommend that you prepare your presenters for the experience. And it is true, it's supposed to say, that slide is supposed to say your presenters. 
I'm going to follow up with that in just one moment. And then the last thing that I would say is establish boundaries. This is boundaries both for instructors and for students in the conversation. So um, a couple of you on the Jamboard brought up that you have concerns about what information students might share out in the class if you bring this topic to the classroom. Set your ground rules in advance. We're talking about this topic in a general way. We're not going to give each other individual advice about how to solve that particular problem with that particular credit card company. Okay, Because if you set those ground rules as you start, it can um, create a better classroom environment where you don't have quite as much of that deep personal sharing. I love to hear students' stories, but I don't know if today they want to tell us the ways that they got in debt with a payday loan company and didn't get out because tomorrow they're still supposed to come back and see these same students. And I don't want to create an environment where they regret something that they said in the classroom, you know? Also as instructor, establish your boundaries with the students. This is what I'm not prepared to give you advice on. I'm not prepared to give you tax advice. I'm not a good expert in giving tax advice. Um, one tool that I use when I teach in that way is to say to people, um, I love that you brought that question to the class today. And it sounds like it's something that's very individual to your situation. Let's talk about that right after the class. And let me see the ways that we might find some resources to work on that. So one, I'm not going to give you, you know, my personal opinion on your tax situation. And two, I am going to acknowledge your question, but I'm not going to address it in the group. So that's a strategy you, you may want to consider. Um, from these strategies, go ahead and put in the chat either which questions you still have, or you can also just ad address it to us because it's a small group, or which strategy you think might be helpful in presenting financial literacy with your students. Thoughts, thoughts, and opinions I want to hear. I really like the idea of utilizing um, experts. <laughs> yeah. Of bringing experts? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also what you were just talking about with acknowledging questions and um, being straight up that you can't answer that right now, but we're going to figure out the answer. We're going to provide referrals or resources to find this out for you. Um, yeah, what do you do when everybody says he wants to learn something different and you know like that for that first one ask learners what they want to learn what if everyone wants something different everybody wants something different right <laughs> um there's a couple ways you can address that one is to create a survey with your students which means that you have some control over the choices two is to look at um when people bring you a couple of different answers, look at how you can incorporate a couple different lessons across the semester. And all of them may not be named financial literacy. Um, so for example, if people want to talk about um, running their own business, that can be a lesson related to workplace, or it can be a lesson related to finance, depending on, on the direction. So you can incorporate that lesson at that time in your, in your curriculum versus people want to um, you know, talk about interest or buying a car or buying a house. The buying a house goes in either your housing lesson or it goes in your shopping lesson, depending on how creative you want to get. And <laughs> buying a car can go in the, the shopping consumer you know, unit and stuff like that. So that's kind of the way I've tried to address it when I get like big diversity in answers. But I, I am also a fan of surveys, which kind of direct a little bit. <laughs> so any other comments, questions, or thoughts? Um, I just want to say a couple of times I've brought somebody to talk about financial literacy to my students. We started that uh, back on November. How does it go? Uh, I mean, how does yeah, it work? Yeah, Do you feel good about it? All of everything, obviously, right? And, um, and 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 he like asks the students about um, 
what are her questions, their questions, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, everybody ha is at different uh, stages. A lot of them have a lot of debt. A lot of them just have their mortgage. A lot of them um, are free of debt, surprisingly. Uh, but uh, because I guess at this point, when we're living longer, at least he was able to establish like a common um, common ground, which is we're all gonna get old, right? What are you gonna do there right? when you're 80, when you're 75? Um, so he was able to, to find that common ground and he used it in a way that um, everybody agrees that that was the main concern, right? And uh, he took action from that point to teach them the basics to all of them, right? So that they can establish this pathway of financial success, right? Some of them are gonna be doing it at a faster rate than others, but um, but they will all be following that same pathway, which is having a, an emergency fund and then start like, I mean, number one, get free of debt and then above budgeting is one and then getting free of debt and then uh, getting your emergency fund set up and then looking up into passive um, generation of money, right, for your retirement. So it's pretty much the same pathway for everybody. It's just that everybody's gonna be able to go through it at different speeds. Um, but uh, I guess that story that I have, it, it comes from uh, specifically, I, I think it was last Thursday, one of those students who is young, right? He's 18, he still lives with parents and everything. But he, he got to class and told me, hey, I already have $800 in my savings account. <laughs> so, oh, that's pretty awesome. And like, the first step was $500 for an unexpected emergency. So $800, now your next step is three months of your expenses, right? To be able to, <laughs> to be unemployed in case you don't want to, which is highly unlikely on his uh, case because he's really young. Uh, and he can get a job anywhere and he doesn't have to get a really, really great job because he has no expenses almost. But but yeah, I mean, um, the students get it when, when they, when it fits their situation and when they see their parents or their uncles or their uh, sibling situation and they don't like it, so they, they will definitely do the effort. You, you have brought up a number of really good points in, in what you're saying there, Raul. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, things that I noticed in what you're saying is that you're talking about how cultivating a good relationship with a good expert in your classroom. Excellent. Financial educators are often better at talking about this these topics than we are as you know language or HSE instructors. Okay, so that that's perfect. Um, and then your little success story about your student, like that is wonderful to hear because you're you're having this student, I mean, even as, as you're saying, well, his current circumstances probably don't require these things, there will be a day when he does not want to live with his parents and whatever he's got in that savings account is going to be helping him to get his first apartment, to get that um, security deposit, stuff like that. So that that's really wonderful to hear that kind of a success from out of the story. And you're also talking about the universality of this topic. I mean, we live in a country where, I mean, all countries pretty much like this, where we all have to deal with money in one way or another. And so this is something that does reach all of our students, you know, even if it may not have been in our textbook. So um, Nina, if you want to share the next slide, please. Yeah, one more thing that I think it's good my mind. Um, we live in a country where we don't take care of elder people. <laughs> so elder people on their own, right? Um, mm -hmm. People in different countries from different cultures, they do take care of them. So that's right. not a lot of concern. So from people, when you deal with immigrants, uh, they need to, you need to raise this awareness that it's highly likely that they won't get their... Um, uh, the usual help that they would get on their countries, right? From, yeah, each from their, country has their, their neighborhood, neighbors, their community, or something. Mm -hmm. uh, here, you're pretty much on your own, uh, and and they they are totally unaware of it. Yeah, right. You you are right. Like our social service structure in this country is quite different from other countries. Madeline, you wanted to say something. Oh hi, yeah, I just wanted to add something. Uh, 
to piggyback on Raul is, um, so we're teachers, we're instructors, we're not financial analysts or bankers, uh, professional in that area. So it's our job to bring an awareness of financial literacy to our students and awareness. So that might be just the very first step of uh, showing them how to do a budget or uh, looking at some different websites about uh, what what career do you want and or or what do you want for your future and how much money are you going to need to get all those things so there's lots of different websites and different ways we can explore that with them but it's really nice you know to have a guest speaker from a credit union or a bank come in and talk about this specifically financial literacy and offer their business cards so the students can go to the bank and share their personal you know financial concerns and their personal questions with a with a professional so what we're doing is offering lessons and conversations and terminology just to get them started maybe on their financial literacy success mission, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I don't think as teachers, we should feel responsible or nervous. Um, it's just just like a little exploration, a little adventure kind of thing. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Really, thanks, Madeline. I really appreciate your perspective on that. And, you know, again, I think we're all kind of coming down to the idea that there's a lot, guest speakers could offer a lot to our classes. And I think you're also reinforcing for us, Madeline, that the, the issue of boundaries. Um, there are the boundaries within the lesson and we are very competent to teach certain things. I'm very competent to teach the vocabulary of the financial system in the United States. I mean, the basic vocabulary, I'm not gonna get into like, you know, if you're gonna go buy stocks and bonds, that's another story. But I can teach you, you know, how to read your tax pay or your pay stub, for example, right? Um, but you know, I'm not necessarily, I, well, I'm definitely not qualified to advise certain things about what you would do with your money and things like that. So thank you for sharing that with us, Madeline. Um, briefly, I want to tell you a little bit about a, um, an activity that I did with my students and just like Raul, I'm all about bringing the uh, speakers into my classroom. So my students, when we were talking about employment, a number of them, and this was in an advanced DSL class, a number of them said, you know, what we really want information about is running our own businesses. And for the, at the time that I was teaching this lesson, I haven't taught advanced in a couple of years now, but at the time that was very reflective of what the labor market in Albuquerque was looking like for immigrants. And of one of the good pathways for my students to build financial stability for their families is actually creating their own business. So I invited someone from our small business development center to present to my students about the services that that organization can offer and about some general things about starting a business in the United States. CNM hosts this small business development center. And I believe that if you are affiliated with a college that probably they have a similar resource at your college in your community. Um, I know two of you are from ABQ ALC. So if you want the contact for um, CNM Small Business Development Center, I'm happy to provide it with you because I think they're the primary provider for Albuquerque. So this was a lesson where incorporating the best practices, I used my learner's input and my learner's circumstances to decide that this was gonna be who our speaker was. Um, it was an example of co-teaching with the guest expert. She presented the class for us. We prepared um, in advance both the students and the presenter. And this, I think, is very key to having a successful experience. I got her handout and we went through the vocabulary in her handout um, prior to her coming in the class period before her coming. We also generated some questions because I knew she would ask, oh, what questions do you have? And if the students were unprepared, they might not ask a question. So we generated um, the question, some questions in advance. And of course, then it was open beyond that. But that gives language learners an opportunity for success because we could practice the questions first. And then um, I also talked extensively with the presenter to let her know who her audience was. 
um, some particular concerns they might have and some things to think about regarding language in the presentation, like what they were likely to understand or not understand based on my having spoken with them for a pretty good period of time at that point. And then this is also an example of establishing boundaries because um, one of the things that she did really well as a presenter was when people started bringing up the my X, Y, and Z in my business, she's like, you know what? Today I'm here to talk with you about some of the general services and um, examples for starting a business in the United States. That is a question that our business counselors answer individually when they provide advice one-on-one um, -on -one with somebody. So this is the number you call to make an appointment with a counselor. And it was such a great model of, you know, not disregarding what people's questions were, but we're also not going to analyze your checks and balances sheet in the classroom today. Okay. Um, so that's kind of my example of bringing a guest speaker and incorporating these TSTM practices into my classroom. And I feel that this activity did a really good job of teaching a number of the, um, the nine essential skills or the nine critical skills. Uh, we, we talked a lot about how to navigate systems in particular. We also talked a lot about processing and analyzing information and about problem solving. Questions? All right, I'm gonna hand this over to Bill. And Nina, you can probably move to the next slide. Bill, you're on mute. Well, I corrected the problem. Thank you. Um, there are two links on this slide. The first one is for the lesson plan for teaching the skills that matter, uh, dealing specifically with uh, financial literacy. Uh, it's pretty comprehensive, probably about three, four or five pages. I use it as a checklist to make sure that we didn't really forget anything. Well, you can follow it if you wish. There's also an example, a link to a video uh, having one of the TSTM, or I think AIR uh, teachers actually present a lesson in financial literacy to their class, which is quite informative. So make good use of that. Um, I think we have the toolbox link there in the chat also. Nina, you want to get to the next slide? Okay, so we are at like 12.50 right now because we had great participation during the webinar and so we had conversation. <laughs> um, but I think uh, the last kind of questions that we sort of have to leave you with and the questions that you, we would invite any questions that you have for us, anything you feel that we did not um, reach, especially from the things that you talked about in the beginning in the Jamboard. But then I would like to know from your point of view, how are you planning to tie financial literacy to student generated content? Or are there any other strategies that you have about honoring students' lived experiences, goals, and personal needs if you're, if you're bringing financial literacy to your classroom? And I'm just gonna kind of open this up to discussion because we are a small group. So I think that's the easiest way to communicate. I mean, I think um, when it comes to financially, like you could assign each student to like a weekly or monthly budget, but I don't know if that will be considered like a student generated content. I think it's student generated content if your um, students or your class indicated to you that budgeting was a topic they were interested in learning. Yeah. 
I think what you were talking about before was serving new students and then having approaching everything with sensitivity um, is going to honor people's experience. And then what Bill was saying about discussion, um, that's really honoring experiences as well because people are going to discuss what whatever the topic is, how it affects them. Um, but you can do so much with it. Those are the two things that we're thinking. You could also use a backdoor approach, and if you were, you know, um, teaching, say, a spreadsheet, you could say that, you know, spreadsheets are very applicable to budgeting and just do a quick example of credits and debits, and that might generate some other interest, like, oh, let's pursue this a little bit further. So, Otter or Madeline, did you have anything you wanted to share on this? Um, I'm just still listening <laughs> because I'm focusing on civil education. So, that's it. Um, when when the next present about civic education? About civics? Civic education. Uh -huh. um, we did the civics one first mm -hmm. and we are in the process of putting the webinars up on um on the propel website and once i get the civics one listed up there the video from it i will send you an email okay okay thank you also suad finance is a civics topic you can make it a civics topic <laughs> thanks Well, thank you. This was very interesting and very thought provoking and uh, very personal. It's a very personal thing. So as long as we um, remember that and, and keep keep that in mind, the integrity of it all. Thank you. Oh, thank you for coming. Go ahead, Nina. I was like, yeah, you're awesome. You did our wrap up for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I learned a lot today. Thank you so much. All right. Nina, go ahead. Hi. Sorry. I I spaced out. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you everybody for showing up and for your um, honest and interesting and thoughtful input. Um, I think I learned a lot from our discussions, so that was great. Um, so yeah, here's our contact information. Um, here's a link for the toolkit of lesson plans. If you uh, would like any help accessing the Lynx website, I know some folks have said that it, it's a little bit confusing for you, or some folks have said, have said it was confusing for them. Um, feel free to reach out and we can, we can help you with that. Um, and yeah, I think that's just about it, unless Rebecca... Um, or Bill, if you want to add anything else. Thank you all for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Rebecca.